Welcome to this video of the Custer Academy. Those who don't know me, I'm Luke de Custer. I founded the Custer Academy and I'm providing YouTube videos related to project management. You can subscribe to my channel. There are a lot of videos already available about different topics. Now, what will I do in this video? I just want to introduce you basically to a new set of three videos that I'm creating. We look at the activity predecessing and calculation of the critical path. Why do I make this video? Well, the reason is very simple. When I see that people are asking a lot of questions about precedence diagrams, about calculations, do I start from zero? Do I start from one? I decided to make this a series of three videos. The first video is about the activity on the arrow methods, which we call the arrow diagramming method. You may also remember the PERT method. Those are methods that were used a long time ago. They're still available. Sometimes you still find them. They're still very interesting, although that the PMI has chosen to use the activity on the node methods for precedence diagramming. And that will be in video two. There I will explain the activity on the node method, basically the precedence diagramming method together with the calculation of the critical path, which is also called the critical path method. And here I will compare the two possibilities. Do I start from zero? Do I start from one? And what are basically the differences? What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? And in the last, the third video, I will talk about adding data to the Gantt chart. We will see that although we used two ways to calculate the start and finish times of the activities, basically when we put them in the Gantt chart, we find the same result. We're starting with video one here. Here I'm going to draw the network diagram where I have here the activities from A to G with their predecessors and their duration. What is important to consider here is that activities A and B have no predecessor. It means they're at the beginning of the project. They're in fact the two activities we can start immediately which will be the one we really have to start at the beginning. We will see later when we do the calculations in video two. The other element is F and G. Those activities have no more successor. It means that they are at the end of the project. Once those two activities have been completed, the project is finished. But let's start with the activity on the arrow, the arrow diagramming method, and we'll see how this method works and how we can use it to our advantage. And you will also understand where the different calculation methods basically come from. The first scheduling method we are going to use and that I will explain to you is the activity on the arrow method, the arrow diagramming method. This was basically at the beginning of the era of project management, a very popular method, but at the same time, we had a different method was, which was evolving. Now, both of those are equivalent, but they're a little bit different. For the activity on the arrow, there are a lot of rules to follow. And basically, the activity on the arrow methods are event-based method. It means that, for example, when we look at an activity, we have the event, which is the starting point of the activity and the end point of the activity, which is the second event. We start with nodes. So we have first a node and we number those nodes. There are different ways you can do the numbering. I will not talk about that here, but there are different methods you can use and it depends on the complexity of the project. This is the start of the project. This is the first node. Basically, it's what we also could call a milestone. Here, the project starts. And typically, we start the project at time zero. Now, we have activity A, no predecessor, so it starts 
immediately at the beginning of the project. So we have A, activity A with a duration of three periods, which ends up in node 1. Now, here we have to be careful because it's not so easy to follow all the rules. There are a lot of rules that we have to follow and we have to be careful about that. So we have here a start point where A starts, in point 1 A finishes. And when I draw that on the time scale, here we have the time scale, which is a continuous time scale. I can draw A, we start at point 0 and we end at point 3. So basically we have three periods, a duration of three periods for activity A. We start at time 0. We end at time 3. It's like you use a chronometer. It starts from 0. When we reach 3, that's the end point of activity A. Let's look at B. B, the same thing. We have another node, node 2. We have B with a duration of 2. So these are, in fact, those nodes. We can only have one arrow between two nodes. Every node is the beginning of one activity and the end of another one. So, zero is the beginning point of A and B. Node one is the end point of A. Node two is the end point of B. Now we have to continue. We go to activity C. C is after A. So, I draw C here with a duration of two. And I call this node 3. Now we have to find out what is happening here. We have D. I can put D here. And this would give me later a problem because I see G has two predecessors. So I will wait with D a little bit longer. So let's go with activity E, which is after B. So I draw activity here, E here with a duration of 3 and I call this the node 4. You will see that afterwards we may have to adjust the drawing because sometimes we made some links that we have to correct later on. Now the other thing why I said we have to be careful is that now we have still activity D to complete. After E we have G. So G is one of those activities at the end of the project. So G has a duration of 6. And I put a note here. I don't put a number in there yet. Now we also know that G is after D. And D is after A. So what I do now I put the activity D here, D with a duration of 5. And now I see in the graph we have A, D is after A, E is after B, and G is after D and E. Now just imagine that E should also be after A and B, would have two predecessors. That would create a problem because I cannot have two arrows between two nodes. I can only have one arrow. In order to resolve that problem, I should draw here a dummy activity. Just to be sure that this rule is correct. So there are some things that you have to be careful about when you're using this method. They have dummy activities and that's not always clear and makes the method a little bit more tricky to complete. Now we also have C. After C we have F and F is also an end activity. So we have activity F with a duration of 3 and the, fin the final note is 5. So this is the start note and this is the end note. And we see F and G end in that end node. And later in the next video, we will see why some people who are using the precedence diagramming method 
try to put some event, some activity at the beginning and at the end of the project because they like these endpoints. Basically, we don't need them, but basically those are also what we call milestones. Now the calculations. Well, when we look at the calculations, we have to see what's happening. A starts at zero, so we already know that. So the node here starts at zero and finishes at three. So what we have is the early finish is early start plus the duration, which is very easy to calculate. Uh, it's a quite easy formula. For B, we have the same. B starts at moment zero and ends at moment two, at time two, a period of two. Now what's next? C will start after A, D will start after A, and E will start after B. So when will C end? Well, it's three plus two is five. When will D end? Three plus five is eight. And E will end at two plus three is five. <sighs> You're still following? It's not so easy sometimes because we see all those numbers and sometimes people get a little bit confused here. I may decide to make a complete exercise like this, a little bit more complex, to see all the different elements that you have to remember when you're using the activity on the arrow. F will start at 5. Now here, when will G start? G will start after D and E. D finishes at 8, E at 5. When G would start at 5, it would not be possible because D is still not finished. So what we have to do, we have to see G can only start when D is finished at time 8. 8 plus 6 is 14. F starts at 5, finishes at 18. So the duration of the project here is 14 periods. We could also do the backward pass, but we're not going to do it here. It would be rather complex. But you see that this is a very interesting method, still very useful, and the calculations are quite interesting to do and easy to do in the forward pass. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it, and I will see you in the next video where we look at the precedence diagramming method. Thank you.